Hello Funketeers, or should I say Folketeers, my name is Dan Whittle. And welcome to another bonus episode of the Cacophony Sessions. Before we kick off Season 3, we wanted to talk about an influential artist who's in the news at the moment, the legendary Canadian singer-songwriter Neil Young. As well as my regular Tom, we're joined by one of the finest journalists in British music history, former Melody Maker writer, chart music compatriot of our former guest David Stubbs, and someone who's been dying to talk about Neil Young for a long time, is Taylor Parks. Hello, oh, you're too kind. <laughs> uh, before we delve too deep into Mr Young, who are, uh, let's get to know a bit about your tastes. Now, as with everyone else whose voice has been featured on our show, it's time for our two most vital of ice-breaking questions. Uh, firstly, your favourite year in music, and then uh, let's see if you can get an undeniable banger past the panel here tonight and into our illustrious wall of fame, shall we? Okay. So what's your favourite year in music, Taylor? Well... Um, I was the earlier years are at a disadvantage in that the only music that existed then was music that had already been made. Whereas if you're living in 1993, like a year when about five good records came out, you could at least listen to music from 20 years earlier and it might feel subjectively brand new and current and glistening with placenta, you know. So I'm always dubious about picking out years um same as i'm always dubious about ranking and rating records with this kind of spurious objectivity which is at odds with the actual experience of pop music but for the sake of a small argument i'm going to say uh rather unimaginatively 1966 Mm, just because people could then still dream of an astonishing future without being accused of naivety. Like at the time, you know, Good Vibrations, Eleanor Rigby, uh, Reach Out, I'll Be There, have all just come out. So You can't really argue with that. Yeah, not only is music fantastic at the time, you've got a sense that, okay, from now on, we can do anything at all. You know, Eight Miles High had just come out. Can you please crawl out your window, the great forgotten Dylan single? And these aren't just great records. They suggest a whole new universe for pop music, right? Um which is artistically startling, but also spiritually spiritually linked to all the good and positive things that were happening in society. So, yeah, you can just think, yeah, there are going to be no dead ends from now on. There are going to be no unforeseen consequences to any of this. It's just a straight upward glide from now on, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm going to say, Ni- 1966. I would like a go on 1966. It doesn't look... <laughs> Preferable. Well, my favourite Dylan album came out in 66 and the Beach Boys Pet Sounds. See, the thing is on the podcast, I, I picked 2003 and argued right. it to death. Um, so, you know, like I'm going to have to be talked back to the 60s because I've always tried to stay quite current. But if we're going to the 60s, that is a very, very good year. Yeah. Revolver as well. Revolver Blonde 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 Pet Sounds, and also an album very relevant to today's discussion as well, because it's a Buffalo Springfield album, 66. Yeah, although that is shit, that album. (laughs) The first Buffalo Springfield album is terrible. Yeah, I didn't say it was good, just said it's relevant to the discussion. Yeah, 1966 is when um, uh, the Blues Breakers with Eric Clapton uh, by John Mayle and the Blues Breakers came out. Um, and probably the best thing Eric Clapton's been involved with, I'm just saying it. I noticed you don't call it the Beano album. Is is there a reason for that? I'm I'm not that familiar with it. Oh, okay. I didn't know if it was the other way around. I didn't know if, like, Blues Breakers' heads feel that it's a bit sort of... Oh, no, no, I'm not. I'm not a diehard. Okay. With what's been going on with, say, Eric Clapton in recent news, which we'll kind of cover a little bit in a moment. Yeah. I decided to go back and reevaluate his back catalogue, um, and it's pretty sparse. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, there's some classics in there, don't get me wrong. Layla is a classic, and uh, then you've got things like Cocaine. Um, but yeah, I think as a, as a musical project... Isn't Cocaine written by J.J. Cale? Yeah. <laughs> I like the, the Eric Clapton version. I, the J.J. Cale version's better. I would argue. See, I would say that Clapton's innovation was not really anything to do with what he played. It was that he realised that if you plugged a solid-body Gibson guitar into a Marshall stack, which a Marshall stack had only just been invented, 
and you turned it up really loud so it was all overdriven. It sounds amazing. Yeah, then you can just go, row, 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 and everyone goes, oh, that sounds fucking great. It doesn't really matter what you play, um, which is why it's so beautiful. There's a clip on YouTube of Cream doing Sunshine of Your Love on the Glen Campbell show in America, where they were touring America, and he didn't have any pedals, right? He didn't have a pedal board or an overdrive or anything like that, because that was his sound. He just plugged his guitar into the Marshall amp and turned it up full. And that was the sound. So then they went into the TV studio, and of course all the engineers are like, no, you can't have that amp that loud. It's a TV studio. We've got limits of what the equipment can deal with. So he had to turn it down. So when he played his guitar, it just went plink, plink, plink. And so they have to do Sunshine of Your Love, and it goes blink, 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 <laughs> blink, 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 blink. And of course, so of course, it gets the solo, and he can't do it because he can't play this ripping, distorted solo. So to try and compromise, he he plays a sort of a country picking type solo. But he's on the Glen Campbell show. <laughs> Glen Campbell can smoke any guitar player in the whole world at that kind of guitar playing. So it's just clapped and standing there being second rate. It's hilarious. <laughs> One of the first records I was ever introduced to by my dad, he only owns about four records. And that's, um, oh, what's the Cream Live album called? Um live cream yeah something i think it might be just be called live cream yeah that was that's one of his like four records he owns and i absolutely loved that record um and then i was introduced to other clapton stuff and i just never really got it yeah having grown up in in a classical music background as soon as anybody plays a blues scale i instantly don't care (laughs) You know, right. like if you're playing a blues scale or a mix of Lydia, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to know. <laughs> Things cream were all right, but it's just, it's that thing. Why, why would anybody ever want to listen to cream in a universe where the Jimi Hendrix experience exists? Yeah. Because they do everything that Cream did and a load of other stuff as well. Even traffic is a better option than cream. Yeah, okay. This is true, although. As a as a bass player, I have to stick up for Jack Bruce because he is a good yeah, bass player. Yeah. He was and the least dislikable member. Yeah. yeah, also true. But yeah, he's he's got some really interesting ways of playing. Uh, he plays bass in very in a very interesting way, and he is a very influential bass player. So I think for me, I've got to stick up for Cream a little bit because yeah. you know, like bass players' union and all of that. Well, it's a muso thing, that, though, isn't it? It's like, I'm a bit like that, just being able to... I mean, I'm not a bass player, but it's like... Like, I hate Yes, right? I love Yes. But I'll say, that guy, <laughs> Chris Squire, right? Chris Squire, what a bass he, he's player. He's possibly... He's my favourite bass player by a long... By probably quite a long way. Yeah, one of the most imaginative bass players I've ever heard. Just put him in another band, please, and I'd listen to it. He's one of the first bass players to use effects pedals, I think, because he uses a flanger on Fragile, uh, one of the tracks on Fragile, and there's a really big, it was a big deal, apparently. But yeah, I love the way he plays bass, but I actually really like Yes, because I was, that's one, another Fragile by Yes is another album that I grew up listening to. So it was like, I, I, I really like Yes. I mean, John Anderson's voice is a bit weird, and what he does outside of yes is bollocks like and uh, is it anderson and vangelis or whatever it is when they did that that that's awful oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but um yes yeah, yes are fantastic um although i went to see them live at plymouth pavilions in like 2000 um and they weren't great <laughs> but then they were probably like 70 at the time it's good to uh, get a foundation for the conversation in the six uh, starting in the 60s we are going to have to go off on a slight tangent though because we do need to know what you're going to propose to us is your undeniable banger to try and get past me and tom which All is right. going to be a difficult task so uh, um let's hear what you've got okay i'm going to come more up to date right forgive yeah, me sure. if i'm treading on in anyone else's footprints here okay um but how about One Thing by Amory? Oh, yes. Because, I mean, you could hear that record and think, well, okay, is this the intro? Or you know what I mean? like, when's this song going to settle down? If, like a lot of British people, you, you know, your concept of music was set and fixed in the school hall with Mrs. Merriweather at the piano, you know. And <laughs> there's a lot of people like this. If anything that doesn't go in circles and 
resolve with an amen cadence. It's not really a proper song. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, don't get me started on that because that's one day I've got going that the influence, good and bad, of Christian hymns on British pop music because it's <laughs> most people's first experience of, of music, right? Julian Cope's whole career was rewriting Christian hymns unconsciously, if you listen to it. But for everybody else, that rhythm on that record is physical. It doesn't wait for you it's to It's got like a it. lot of energy. Yeah. It's not, it's, not, it's not a record that makes eyes at you across the room. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's an immediate, deep, inescapable connection to something far better than sitting around talking and assessing things. You know what I mean? Who could fail to respond to that record? Yeah, it, it's a... Um... It's it's a track that it reminds me of the really high energy intro to Beyonce's uh, big single. Yeah, Crazy in Love. So it's it's like the high energy intro to Crazy in Love, but maintained over a whole song. Yeah, uh, which which itself is from uh, a Shy Lights song, I believe. And Beyonce one is yeah. Yeah, and that's the best part of both of those songs. Yeah. So what they've done is they built the song around that that one hook, and it yeah it just. It, it slaps that song. I love it. It's, it's a yes for me, but Tom. I don't actually know it. I probably do know Ooh. it, but I don't know it by name. So I'd have to. I, so you, you're selling it really well. Um, I'll have to. I'll have to listen to it later. I would hum it to you, but it's not the kind of record you no. can really hum to. It's all right. <laughs> I, I reckon I'll put it on later and i'll i'll recognize it and you've sold it really well so i'll probably agree but unfortunately that'll have to hold off yeah tom's idea of straightforward pop is more chamber pop um <laughs> that that's kind of where tom comes from uh the way he he listens to things whereas i i i will quite happily go down as a wham fan uh not just a george michael fan but i'm a wham fan and i i actually think i was thinking the other day and this may i may edit this out because it may bore people but um I was thinking the other day, George Michael is actually a rap pioneer because he was one of the first, like, that's one of the first, 1982, okay, we've had Sugar Hill Gang, uh, Grandmaster Flash, but the Wham rap is still quite early. It's it way is, before yeah. Run DMC. And George Michael's attempt, yeah, some of the lines are really cringy, but the delivery's not awful. It's not parodied to the, uh, to the length of something like Criss Cross. Uh, no, I, think, yeah. I think George Michael's a better rapper. <laughs> no 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 you're right and yeah it was before that point where because you know how rap became the officially sanctioned music of childhood mm. right? like when i was a kid it was folk music was the officially sanctioned music of childhood and all music in schools programs and that you'd hear in school was always was always english folk music yeah and at some point in the 80s that changed to rap because teachers realized okay it's easy you don't have to play an instrument and Kids can express themselves more easily through rap. Um, also, it, it it's modern, and they might actually like it. Uh, and what? Yeah, one rap was before that. I think you could probably um, go to prison for writing a song like one rap. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just about being on the dole and how brilliant it is because you don't have to work. <laughs> yeah, because the benefit gang are gonna pay. Oh. It's ludicrous how it goes against like the general narrative in society now, um, and how how like benefit scroungers are looked down upon. George Michael was advocating for that long, long ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a very strange reversal. I I think I know to uh, to go back to your point about um, when rap became the music associated with childhood. I reckon I can find the the ground zero of of songs. I reckon Candy Girl by New Edition. Oh, it's yeah. the ground zero for that. Like yeah. after that, all like modern teenagers are into rap because uh, after that kind of shift. Um, so maybe Bobby Brown's got uh, something to actually add to a legacy uh, other than drugs and uh, potentially expediting the death of Whitney Houston. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We are here to talk about Neil Young, 
uh, we decided to we've only done one uh, solo artist special before and that was on Prince I'm in detox so I'm not mentioning Prince that's the last time uh, tonight is about Neil Young now I'm not an expert on Neil Young but I've got into him over the last few months and then he becomes big news because he's withdrawn all his music from Spotify um, due to them being the uh, the host the uh, primary financer of uh, Joe Rogan's uh, the Joe Rogan Experience podcast um, over his misinformation surrounding the COVID vaccine. Um, now, without wanting to get too bogged down in the politics and really, really put people off, um, did just want to kind of uh, invite Taylor your thoughts on on that kind of situation and what well, what you felt when I mean, you withdrew his music. It's all a little bit embarrassing, isn't it? I mean, the, the, like for a start, Joe Rogan is a bell end, um, but he's not the sort of meathead fascist nut that people paint him as. He's actually fairly moderate, sort of blue collar Boston Democrat, you know. Yeah. Politically. But there's two issues there. Firstly, he's a comedian from that kind of early 2000s generation of East Coast American comics who were all about saying the wrong thing and bringing up the terrible idea and putting stuff out in public, you know, in pursuit of greater honesty, man, and understand all this sort of stuff. It's, you know, a bit like, but the problem with Rogan is that unlike Louis C.K., when <laughs> Louis C.K. was acceptable in polite society, he wasn't very funny. Um, but that was the aesthetic. It was like it was a moral obligation for a comedian to say the wrong thing and to say what people don't yeah. want you to say, right? Uh, he seems to have carried that over a little bit into like that naughty schoolboy thing, you know. Like it's like if you oh if I say the wrong thing and and everyone's going to get really angry with me. It's like if I don't do that, I'm betraying the legacy of Lenny Bruce and Richard Pryor and George Carlin and all this sort of thing. And the other thing about Rogan is he's this he's the worst sort of autodidact in that his hunger for new information is not reined in by critical thinking. At all. He's got no bullshit detector when it comes to ideas outside of his own sphere of experience, right? So you, you, you put those two things together and you get this guy accidentally giving a platform to dangerous weirdos and, you know, thinking he's just trying to open up the debate. You know? But at the same time, getting off on the horrified looks on the faces of people who know more than he does, right? But then... On the other hand, it's like, okay, well, hey, Neil Young and Joni Mitchell have taken their music off Spotify. You know, well, that's a big deal in 1975. Um, but it's, you know, okay, yeah, you know, okay, now your dad's going to have to listen to them on YouTube. It's, I mean, while asking you who Joe Rogan is. Um, and I mean, it's, you know, it's, this has been discussed previously on the internet and stuff, but. Neil Young's principled stance on this is a little bit meaningless. First of all, while he's still got his music on Amazon, for instance, yeah. um, which are vastly worse. They all espouse each other, all the platforms. But there's, there's, there's a very interesting thing being shared around. So I, um, I have some friends on Facebook who are very right-wing, who I disagree with immensely, but sometimes it's funny to see what they say. Oh, yeah. Hogwatch. Yeah, absolutely. And they, they, there's a thing being shared around pointing out, apparently, that Neil Young has had a problem with the quality level of the audio with streaming in Spotify for years and that this is a yeah. convenient excuse to virtue signal. Now, whether that's true or not, considering it's shared by right-wing nutjobs, um, it, it does... It does strike me as odd that he would choose to pull from Spotify. Now, good on him for doing it because... I think there there's a there's a fine line. So I should also point out this this stage that I have a master's degree in public health. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you know, like there there is a fine line between um, looking for the truth and deliberately so interviewing nut jobs. And deliberately interviewing nut jobs for an audience reaction is fine. Deliberately interviewing nut jobs in the middle who who are essentially COVID deniers in the middle of a pandemic that is claiming huge numbers of lives is frankly irresponsible. And for an audience that 
uh, look up to you. Do you know what I mean? Like, as far as Rogan's audience is concerned, this is not a freak show where you're just going, who's this? What's the next guy going to yeah, say? Absolutely. You know, he's, uh, he's creating this narrative that is, that is feeding into what people want to believe. You know, like, so I work as a healthcare professional and I get people coming in and telling me that COVID's a hoax, you know, and and people like that are listening to Joe Rogan and going, well, I'm not going to get vaccinated. And I'm like, I I had a, I have a spiel now explaining to people what mRNA is in appointments because they seem like it's, it's not going to kill you. Like, (laughs) well, it most likely isn't. Yes. There's like, risks of allergies and things but you know it's it so what he's spreading is 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 dangerous disinformation and on the one hand i, I heard neil young had pulled his stuff off and they're like great fantastic and then Joni mitchell goes as well and you're like great this is going really well and then nothing actually yeah. there is one other that has withdrawn oh, who is it his his catalogue from Spotify and I almost did the special on this artist instead, but I didn't think I'd get any takers. Um, uh, Barry Manilow has followed suit. Oh really? Um, so yeah, um, so good for Barry. Oh, I uh, thought he was proper. a good egg under everything. I get that vibe from Barry. Yeah, yeah. from so, Barry Manilow. So good on him for that. But yeah, if you're keeping your streaming, if you're keeping your music, if you're pulling from Spotify and you're keeping it on Amazon or Apple or YouTube, which is owned by Google now, is it? I don't know. Yeah. If you're keeping it on those, you know, like, fuck off. (laughs) And also, like, I mean, it's quite easy for the multi-millionaire Neil Young to toss away that bit of beer money that he was going to get off Spotify, you know. And there's also the fact that this is the very same Neil Young who not that long ago did a whole concept album about the make-believe horrors of genetically modified food. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? No. It's not not his finest work. And he did a whole round of interviews on TV and everything, going like, oh, everybody's got to stop eating genetically modified food. It's terrible. It's going to kill you. And it's, you know, so good luck positioning yourself now as a defender of uh, scientific truth over hippie <laughs> conspiracy shit. I really hope that Spotify have left just that album. <laughs> <laughs> just that one album, Neil Young's Misinformation album. Um, my my two thoughts on it, I, I kind of, I, I look at the the intentions of both both parties and I, I think ultimately it's meaningless. It's about money and it, nothing's going to change. The domino effect that I kind of hoped it would have filtered pitted out pretty quickly. Barry yeah. Manlow, Joni Mitchell, that's it. Um, but I do look at, in in terms of which is which is done on better faith. I think Neil Young uh, is doing it because I, I read somewhere that him and um, Joni Mitchell um, they were one of the first people to get the um, the vaccine against. I think it was polio. Well, yeah, Neil Young yeah. had polio, didn't he? As a child. yeah, Neil Young, uh, Neil Young had polio, and then they were in the the kind of generation to get the polio shots. Um, so they're quite they're pro vaccine. Um, so I think he, I think Neil Young's coming from a better place uh, than yeah. Joe Rogan is in 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 continuing to do it. I think with Joe Rogan, he knows that it's going to get him numbers, and I think that's where it becomes an issue because he is just uh, asking these guests on to get numbers. It's all about the, the content yeah, for him. Yeah. Um, and he, he's getting to the point where um, Jamie, his producer, is is pulling stuff up. Uh, Pull that shit up, Jamie, as he always <laughs> says. Uh, um, and he's pulling it up and it's disagreeing with his narrative. And he's he's saying like things like, oh, yeah, but it's the VAERS report. Like, who trusts the VAERS report? Yeah, yeah. And the VAERS report is the thing that everybody trusts. Oh, it's, yeah, like my auntie got a headache. It's that, isn't it? It's basically, yeah. And so he's being very, very deliberate with it. Um, Joe Rogan, I, I've listened to his podcast for years. Um, and like you said, he is, um, he's somebody who, he's not particularly malicious and he's not, I don't think he's a, he's a, he's a particularly bad person. And why, what, what, he came out recently and did some apology for, um, some, uh, uh saying the N word on, on his podcast and all the connotations that come with that. And I think that was a, a show of growth, which is, which is a good thing, uh, but he refuses to budge on certain issues. And the first one was weed. You'll never budge on that. Um, he's very pro weed. Uh, and the second one seems to be he's pro COVID. Uh, he just doesn't yeah. seem to want it to go away because his only solution, other than taking the vaccine, is to take 
the human variant of a, a horse dewormer. Um, and it's just, it's just silly. It's not offering any anything constructive. So I think for me, Neil Neil Young wins, but no, nothing really changes. No. Uh, it's all very petty and such is the state that we live in where we can hyper focus on nothing these days i'll tell you what i'll tell you what i didn't like was the usual kind of people immediately oh neil young's in the news what's there's a controversy immediately trawling every interview everything he's ever said and done every Mm -hmm. song lyric in history looking for something to make him look shitty yeah um you know, which they can then hold up as, this is the true Neil Young right here, this thing I eventually found. Um, and doing the same to Joe Rogan as it happens, like, it's, oh, here's Joe Rogan saying the N-word. It's like, yeah, you ever watched American yeah. comedians from that period? It was like, that, it wasn't yeah. seen as a, as a, you know, depending on context, it wasn't seen as a racist thing. It was just street language, man. It's not like that now, but, you know, that's what happens. So... After about a week, somebody found the quote from Neil Young from, like, the mid-'80s, talking about AIDS, um, when he says... uh, I mean, he was a a complete loon, by the way, in the mid-'80s, right? Um, He'd been irrelevant for more than a decade. He'd gone a little bit loopy. And he's talking about AIDS, and he says... uh, And I remember reading this interview at the time. He says, it's scary, you're in the supermarket and you see a faggot behind the cash register, you don't want him to handle your fucking potatoes, which is a really stupid thing to say or stupidly expressed. But when you read it in context, he's actually being self-deprecating about his own paranoia and he's making fun of himself for being and everybody else for being absurdly paranoid uh, about AIDS. But, of course, if you strip that bit out of the quote, (laughs) it looks massively homophobic. Like above and beyond, like oh, here's a man born in the 1940s, uh, casually using the word faggot in the 1980s. You know, quite a few of those, including non-homophobes, right? But not that Neil Young was a hero at that time, because that was his Reagan period, where he decided he was like a good old boy and he loved Ronald Reagan and all that. And then two years later, he's doing interviews saying that he wants Jesse Jackson to be president. So this is the thing about Neil Young; he's totally erratic and unreliable in every way he's bright but he doesn't actually know very much um he's not educated or anything like that and he changes his mind on everything all the time so gm crops are satanic but vaccines are fantastic you know and it's all incoherent but i don't care because he's a rock music and he's a rock musician pushing 80 (laughs) <laughs> what what do what do people expect? What do people want from a rock musician pushing eighty health advice? Do you know what I mean? Spiritual guidance. It's rock and roll. They're all idiots. Just get used to it. It brought out the kind of usual thing you see when this kind of thing happens is you get all these people rushing onto Neil Young's YouTube and putting, "I've never heard of this guy. Who is this guy?" And yeah. it's like, well, what is that? Try, I don't. I never understand what that's trying to achieve. They that always happens as well. So you get it's just everything is decided by YouTube comments now, and it's really making me sick. I have better things to do with my time than read YouTube comments. I I evidently don't. So <laughs> we're breaking down tonight's conversation into three main parts. So we are going to uh, discuss our favourite Neil Young albums, uh, then our individual favourite Neil Young songs, and then finally we're going to go. And look elsewhere for our favourite Neil Young cover versions. So a song covered by another artist that was written originally by Neil Young. We'll start off with our favourite albums. And I'm going to start with Tom. So Tom, take it away. What's your favourite Neil Young album and why? Okay, so I'm going to go with the really obvious. um, But it's obvious for a reason. And I'm going to go with Harvest. I flip flop between two. So Neil Young, the first, my first exposure to Neil Young was I had a cassette player um, and there was one of those, do you remember you used to get those really weird cassettes from HMV in like the seventies and eighties? And my dad had stacks of them. It's, sort of yellow, it's like a yellow piece of cardboard. Vaguely. And it had um, Heart of Gold on it. Um, and I quite liked it. And I listened to that one track for ages. And then I completely forgot about Neil Young until 
I was listening to a Flaming Lips album that had a cover of After the Gold Rush on it. Brilliant cover, not my favorite, not my favorite Neil Young cover, but it nearly was. Um, so then I went back to Neil Young again and listened to After the Gold Rush and Harvest, um, and then I started playing open mic nights. And at the time when sort of Turin Breaks and Star Sailor were cool, um, <laughs> were they ever cool? I don't know. I must have been asleep. <laughs> it was the early, yeah, it was the early 2000s. <laughs> it was acceptable. Oh, yeah, I was asleep. Seeing acoustic versions like Old Man and The Needle and Damage Done are just, are just brilliant. I think it's probably of his albums that I know well, and I don't know his back catalogue that well. I think I know sort of what he was doing from the late sixties to the, to the late seventies. Although like my exposure to Neil Young as a, as a kid was my dad saying he was the guy who ruined Crosby, Stills and Nash. <laughs> <laughs> That's a daring opinion. That's, that is my dad's actual opinion. Wow. <laughs> Only if you're getting a tattoo and have to get more words. Out of it. <laughs> my dad, one of his records is the Crosby, Stills and Nash album. So, so like this is this is where it's coming from, um, and so yeah, so that era of Neil Young Harvest, like every track on it is is decent. It's got two of my favourite Neil, Young, not my favourite Neil Young song though, which will come up later, but two of my favourite Neil Young songs, the the Neil Young song I first heard. So I think for that reason alone, it's got to be Harvest, and it's his only US number one album, isn't it? I think. I think so. It was actually the number one album in this country when I was born. Oh, wow. Uh, it's better than the number one single when I was born, which was a little bit less cool. It was uh, Amazing Grace by the pipes and drums of the Scots Guards or whatever they <laughs> How did they have those number ones in the 70s? I really don't understand. There's so many of those novelty records. Oh, Granny got. Power. Yeah. That does not exist anymore. Anyway. No, they're all listening to Neil Young. <laughs> I've just looked at what song was number one when I was born. Oh, I know mine was um, Steve Silk Hurley's Jack Your Body. Nice. Which is, uh, uh, I, I, I was always disappointed when I was a kid because I was like two weeks removed from either having um, Jackie Wilson's Re Petite uh, or um, I Knew You Were Waiting For Me by Aretha Franklin right. and George Michael. Um, and I was lumbered with this track that didn't really get played on pop radio anymore, so I'd never heard it. A few years ago, I went back and checked it out, and yeah, that, that song is incredible. Yeah. I, I like Chicago House now anyway, so that's all good. Tom, go on. Teeth house, China in your hand. <laughs> what, what <was> that? <laughs> I like that record, but then I like most things. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite album uh, by Neil Young. Uh, it was difficult. Um, and as someone who is getting into Neil Young, having only heard maybe Heart of Gold and a few others, um, listening to them all at once and then deciding which is the, the, the best one. I'm going to go with the second one I listened to for now, um, which is Zuma, uh, which was uh, an album he did um, with Crazy Horse in 1975. Um, the first one I listened to was actually Tonight's the Night, which was which was from the same year. Was well, hang on, was that the first Neil Young album you listened to in its entirety? Was yeah. Tonight's the Night. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> that really is going in raw, <laughs> no lube. I just started in the middle um, and thought I go nineteen seventy five. It seems a nice a nice round year. Um, let's start there. Tonight's the Night. I enjoyed it, um, but Zuma the least was... commercial record he ever made. Mm. Yeah, I have a habit of doing this. Um, it doesn't make things any easier. But um, Zuma was certainly a bit more appealing in terms of its accessibility. Um, but I really like the fact that it's book almost bookended by um, two really lo uh, well, longer songs, Danger Bird and Cortez the Killer, which was a single. Um, but I really just, I, I think it's something to do with the production on the album um, and um, Ralph Molina's drums. I, th I just think that there's something there that I didn't hear on maybe something that I really like, like um, After the Gold Rush. Uh, there's just something about the production on Zuma that I really, I was really digging uh, at the time. Um I've uh, I've got here in my notes actually that Danger Bird um, bears some sort of and this and it's out a couple of years before uh, but it bears some similarities to um, Bootsy's Rubber Bands I'd Rather Be With You um, 
And I thought that was an interesting melodic link oh, there. Oh, that's, yeah, or as later her mutated into uh, Freak Like Me by yeah. Dina Howard. And then that Sugar the Babe. The Sugar Babe song, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought that was interesting. So it, there's, there's certainly records that came after. It also, um, it reminded me a lot of um, Warren Zevon. Um, and his um, Excitable Boy album that came out about three years oh, later. The yeah, singing is entirely yeah. different. Um, I wasn't sure. I thought that the biggest barrier for me with uh, with Neil Young would be his voice, but I, I'm I'm quite fine with it because I, I decided that his voice is actually halfway between David Byrne and Todd Rundgren. Right. And I really love both of those artists, and that he's got the same kind of timbre and tone in his voice as, as a couple of things that they would do. So I fully on board with the vocals um and uh, yeah folk is not my my forte i i prefer r&b funk music um so i wasn't sure how i was going to get on with his catalog but there is something really incredible about his his ability to tell a story over the course of a song uh, and something like cortez the killer which has like allusions to um a spanish dictator i believe it's never obvious what the song is about yeah, because it's completely ahistorical. Yeah, like he had a, he had a phase of writing historical songs, right? About um, you know, like little vignettes from history. But because he didn't know anything about history, they were all wrong. <laughs> it's really funny because it's the seventies; it didn't matter. <laughs> like if you handed Cortez the Killer in a schoolwork in a middle school history class about the Aztecs, it would come back plastered in red pen. Right. For a start, he spelt Cortez wrong, which is not... Yeah, it was spelt with an, an S. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm just looking here. It's inspired by Hernan Cortez with an S, who was a conquistador who conquered Mexico for Spain in the 16th century. So he's right. gone, yeah, a very up-to-date contemporary pop. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and in siding with the underdog there, Neil Young sings, uh, hate was just a legend and war was never known of one of the most obsessively cruel and warlike societies in history. But, you know, <laughs> but I like the alternative world history that only exists in Neil Young's songs, like Powderfinger, which is like, oh, it's a, a touching story of a someone, some innocent young man dying in a war. But when you examine the lyrics, it doesn't fit into any period or any conflict that's ever happened. <laughs> it's just <laughs> something out of his head. Or Pocahontas, which is... Um, not only takes white fetishization of Native Americans to uh, a new super direct level where he's literally singing about meeting Pocahontas and banging her, um, <laughs> but also manages to bring Marlon Brando into the picture. But it's, it's the thing with Neil Young, he never read books, you know, and he most certainly was not any kind of scholar, but he was able to put ideas down in a way that where you can respond to the feeling in what he's done. I haven't chosen an, a, a Crazy Horse album, um, even though some of them, I think, appear on it. So let's talk, talk briefly about Crazy Horse, who I do love because they're sort of crap. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I mean, as musicians, Crazy Horse are probably about as good as I am, which is to say competent, but well below the standards of uh, successful rock bands of the 1970s technically speaking. Um, but it's just the same same as Neil Young did with his voice. They use the limitations and idiosyncrasies instead of covering them up, right? You know, they can play better than a garage band, but they've got that garage feel that they're a bit primitive and a little bit too loose. Uh, but the difference is every garage band in history plays with everything mushed into a sort of muddy din. And as Crazy Horse never did that, they played with a lot of space and a kind of weird openness, um, which is obviously what Neil Young latched onto immediately. He, was, he wanted a band who sounded a bit rough because it's what he was into. But I think that must be what he heard in them, that immense space in the way they play. Um, it was, it's similar to how the White Stripes sound. Yeah. I think. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. But, it's, you know, cra like Crazy Horse could play a basic rhythm track for 10 minutes and it would be all rickety and wobbly but it would sound like it was crying out for someone who sings and plays like neil young to come along and express himself over the top of it and then you end up with down by the river you know what i mean 
It's uh, and the rest is of uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young couldn't see it. They took it as a personal insult whenever Neil Young went off with, to play with Crazy Horse instead of doing another tour with Crosby, Stills and Nash. Right, like he's gone from playing with Crosby, Stills and Nash's rhythm section, which was like a Motown bassist uh, and a really good drummer, um, and you know the the arid technical ability of Stephen Stills, who's one of my least favourite lead guitarists because he just goes up and down a blues scale at mid-pace forever. Um, <laughs> you know, and all these heavenly backing vocals. Like, he would turn his back on all that and and, and go and play with these this bar band that no other 70s superstar would have been seen dead playing with, you know. And that was the part of Neil Young that the other three never understood. Like Crosby hated Crazy Horse. And I love David Crosby. I've got to be honest. His autobiography is one of the best rock autobiographies ever, which he wrote when he just got off crack or freebase. Um, And in revealing himself in the book to have been a complete asshole and being completely honest about it while telling his hilarious drug stories, he comes out of it incredibly well. And, uh, you know, I like direct contrast to Graham Nash's autobiography, which is all about how amazing Graham Nash is. Uh, Like he's always (laughs) quoted himself, like things he said to people that he's really proud of. And it just leaves you wanting to seek out Graham Nash and ram the book up his cock, you know. It's a hideous, hideous person. Um, But... David Crosby's musical aesthetic is all about this sort of crystal glass ping, you know, because he's got perfect pitch and all that sort of stuff. And he likes Joni Mitchell records and Steely Dan records. And that's what music is to him, you know, Um, which is all great, but he just doesn't get the other side to music um, and the other side to Neil Young. It just, it doesn't mean anything to him. So what's your uh, favourite record uh, that Neil Young made then, Taylor? All right, it's not the most controversial choice, uh, but it's always been my favourite, On the Beach, um, because of all the different Neil Youngs that ever existed, this is the one that I like the best, right? Sort of bleary and patched together, and he's a bit sore about Watergate and all this sort of stuff. It's um, that kind of burnt-out America of the mid 70s is is weirdly appealing to me right like i like all the neil youngs to some extent i like the young neil young when he's sort of grinning and getting on well with stephen stills and jigging about you know playing the playing these vicious lead lines on a massive gretch semi-acoustic uh i like that and i like the the long-haired superstar neil young and crazy horse you know in his check shirt lumbering from one foot to the other like a, a stegosaurus <laughs> without playing the les paul feeding back and he's like grimacing and missing notes and stuff and i i, I like that as well and i can sort of tolerate the older neil young when he's into causes and he's he's he, you know some of which he understands and some of which he doesn't and he's still wearing his tight patch jeans and he's got a straw hat to cover up his bold patch, you know, and he's doing crime in the city and stuff and Harvest Moon. That's all right too. But this worn out mid seventies malaise, Neil Young is the one that I really appreciate. And tonight's the night is probably the purest expression of that. Um, But there's just too much sort of shambling tequila boogie on the album for me which I'm not mad about. Whereas on it the does beach, meander a bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because they're all pissed for the whole album. They're all pissed and on coke, just sort of... They're only on coke so they don't fall over from how much tequila they've drunk. Um, they're completely out of it. I, I, don't, I won't go into that because it's well documented, but I don't know if you know the story of that. It was when, like, um, his lead guitarist had died of a heroin overdose and his, his, one of his other mates had just died of a heroin overdose. He's roadie um, or guitar tech. And so... He went into a massive depression and he ended up doing tonight. This was in 1973, two years before it came out, because it was seen as unreleasable for a couple of years because he was this big superstar and this album sounded like he, you know, recorded it drunk overnight, which he had. Um, so, yeah, it's 
it's not easy listening. Whereas on the beach, it's like it's got that same feeling, but it's it's perfectly judged, you know, and it's just messy enough, but no messier, you know. Um, and it sounds beautiful. And everybody knows what side two of that album is all about, you know, when it's very late at night and you, for whatever reason, you don't want to move for 20 minutes and you're – it was all brooding and desolate, but all is not completely lost. That sequence of three songs on side two of On the Beach is the greatest thing you've ever heard because it's keening and 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 emotional, but it's it's downbeat and subdued and thoughtful. It's not somebody screaming and shouting. It's the sound of a depression being withstood and absorbed and processed into creativity in the near certain knowledge that things will get better, which is why it's got that really odd atmosphere to it. Um, and not a lot of popular music has ever settled there. You know, it's not crying and blubbering. It's just sort of fatalistic, you know. It's not a coincidence that virtually the last words on the album are, you're all just pissing in the wind. You don't know it, but you are. Um I was obsessed with that song Ambulance Blues when I was about 19, knowing that this was something I would never be able to do myself, right? With my cultural upbringing and my English absence of raw, soulful self-expression, you know. Um, because this is... So I told you I was going to ramble off on tangents here. But look, this is, this is the thing... Be my guest. This is the thing to me about, about Neil Young. It sounds a bit ridiculous at first, but... To me, Neil Young, or the best of Neil Young, is white soul music. Right? Obviously, it's not remotely like anything you'd call soul music. It's about as unlike soul music as it's possible to get. But what I mean is it does the same thing in the same way and ends up yeah. somewhere totally different because it's a white guy from Chile, Canada. right? Um, yeah. But it does the same thing. It takes roots music, which in this case is folk and country uh, rather than gospel and blues and old spirituals and it brings them into the present day or what what was then the present day modernized and semi-recognizable but kept simple enough to be used as a channel for the outpouring of raw emotion right uh, uh, like it's like these historical forms of music have got some sort of ghostly magic you know, like they're a channel or, a, you know, it's like you're plugged into a history that's bigger and broader than your own experience, you know, which validates and legitimizes your own experience. And it opens up this way to communicate extreme, extreme feeling in its raw form. And the music is basic enough that you have to make it work with your performance and your own intensity and musical charisma. Um, you don't just have to give us the notes that are written down on the page. You know, you have to do it. It's your thing that you have to do. Um, and that's how soul music works. And that's how Neil Young music works. It's a white equivalent to soul music, which doesn't steal moves or pretend to be what it's not. Right. But yeah. this is why pure pop fans hate Neil Young so much because all of that stuff is totally anti pop or it's or it's the opposite of pop. Right. But that's okay because I like both. I don't see any contradiction between liking Neil Young and liking, you know, Sparks um, any more than I can see a contradiction between liking Granary Bread and liking Ice Cream. Do you know what I mean? And as a musician, you can probably only do one of those things, but as a listener, you, you're you not under those restrictions. And, you know, you could listen to both of those kinds of music if you like. Definitely. I think that's that kind of explains why when I was just starting to get into Neil Young, having so much history with pop music that I kind of felt this is a bit different for me to get into um, because it is, as you say, anti-pop. It doesn't the, the, the same the same devices and hooks in song music are, are absent in their recognisable forms in his music. Yeah, totally. I understand. I, I see that. Yeah. Oh, and I'll tell you what, if there's the ultra on the beach, right? Which is that if this was not released as an album, if this had ever been released as an album, maybe I would have picked this as my favourite album. The 
ultra on the beach is the bootleg of his live show, which is just him on the guitar, at the bottom line in New York, uh, which is easy to hear now because it's on YouTube, um, in early 1974, where he just turns up and he's stoned and everybody else in the room is obviously stoned as well. And he plays just, it's the most intimate sort of melancholy but cosy sounding gig you've ever heard. Uh, He opens with Pushed It Over The End, which is a a sort of seven-minute track that should have been on On The Beach, but he kept it back for Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young to play on their 1974 Doom tour. But they turned it into a sort of rambling, like if I'm in any position to criticise anything for me, (laughs) but they did it as like almost like a jazz rock uh, epic, which didn't really come off. But Neil Young just does it solo acoustic. But because it's Neil Young and it's 1974 and he plays a little secret club gig and he has the confidence to open with a seven-minute solo acoustic track, you know. And the offhand flippantness to introduce it with a silly made-up title. He says, this is called Citizen Kane Junior Blues, which is obviously what it should have been called. Um, But listen to that. The rest of that gig is just him chatting and joking with the, the crowd doing his sort of, you know, crowd-pleasing business, which he always used to do if you ever hear live people. You go, oh, nice sweet smell coming off the audience and all this sort of thing and doing like dopey little raps between songs. Like he tells you how to make a honey slide, which is uh, heated up marijuana and honey um, poured into the mouth off a flat knife. Um, but because he's a massive sexist, like most of that lot, like, he's – He's going, well, what you do? You get your lady to heat up on the stove. <laughs> it's like, it's like nothing which involves a kitchen or a, a stove could ever be men's work, you know, <laughs> even if you're just prepping some drugs. But it's 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 like the recordings of him playing folk clubs and stuff on his early gigs where he's chatting to the crowd and making them laugh between songs, which is what people used to do, you know. But because it's 1974... The songs that he's doing are like ambulance blues and on the beach, and uh, he does a version of Green Sleeves, you know, and Pardon My Heart, and all this sort of all these stretched out, mopey, acoustic blowouts, you know, full of all full of open chords and bad harmonica playing, and uh, and that's that's really my favourite Neil Young, and no, because nobody else could make it work, because nobody, with the possible exception of Bob Dylan had that musical charisma. Do you know what I mean? That's the secret of Neil Young. It's like, yeah. why is this this sort of shambling, sometimes out of tune, often really, really simple music, why is it so captivating? It's because he's got musical charisma, and it, it's that simple. And if I picked up my guitar now and started singing and playing a Neil Young song, nobody would want to listen to it because I don't have... <laughs> incredible musical charisma and he does so that's how he can just follow these paths out and out and out into sharky waters you know and and take the audience with him and in fact it becomes more mesmerizing the further out he gets when he's doing these absurd 10 minute guitar solos you know uh, and it but it's not an excuse to wank off and everyone has to admire his technique you know that's not what he's doing he's dragging you out into this this weird musical world where things don't really make sense you know what it is it's like it's like on the beach has been compressed down into this little solo badly recorded bootleg where all these songs are crunched up and then allowed to unravel again and just keep unraveling and drift out into this endless stone space sounds like one for a late night just a bit yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah so on the beach of my favorite neil young, neil young album just ahead of um after the gold rush because although it's got a similar emotional feel it's it's a young man's album right which is not a bad thing but i'm not a young man so i feel on the beach more deeply I love After the Gold Rush, although it's probably third for me because I think second, I've got to shout out Russ Never Sleeps. Yeah. Because I never got to see I never got to see Neil Young and Crazy Horse, Horse Live. Um, and like that was 
I mean, it was 78. Yet. It was, yeah, yet. <laughs> yeah. I love the way they've recorded it live and then overdubbed it in the studio. I think that's really good. And I think it's, it's something yeah. that's done a lot now, but I don't think, I don't get the feeling it was done a huge amount then. Yeah, I think from a technological perspective, it was probably quite difficult to make. It's got my, my, hey, hey, out of the blue. Um, hey, hey, my, my, into the black. And Yeah. Neil Young, when I, I actually almost always prefer live recordings. Like when you when you see him do, with, the, with him and acoustic guitar doing Old Man or The Needle and the Damage Done, it's infinitely more powerful than he is on record. And so Rust Never Sleeps is like, a polished version of him live and it really it works for me like i i really like yeah. it yeah that last track is it um it hey my hey into my into the black yeah i that that's almost like the first industrial rock song the way they i think they recorded it uh, from what i was reading they recorded it um and added in lots of sounds of clanging doors and things like that uh, to to the snare uh, to really morph it into something quite industrial sounding way before. I mean, I know Neil Young is referred to as the godfather of grunge, but there's definitely some industrial metal uh, sounds coming from that particular song. Yeah, yeah. Well, th- this is what's so great about him is that he understood that that a part of rock music is is just noise, not not just noise like turn your guitar up, but actual literal noise. You know, just the, it, like even on on the beach, which is a, a fairly sort of zonked out album, and even on the worst track on on the beach, which is uh, Vampire Blues, he plays a solo at the end of that which is just him digging into one string on one note, just sort of truffling and making it horrible. It just sort of goes... And it's really loud in the mix. And that's his guitar solo. That's what he does. That's how he plays. And he can play really well if he wants to, but he chooses to do this. I like the stylistic choices in his guitar playing, though, because nobody needs another Clapton, you know. (laughs) <laughs> no, no no well did we need a clapton as we established earlier i remember going to see dragon force live and it's they are probably the worst gig i've ever seen because i do not care about watching guys wank off their guitars because they can play amazingly whereas actually you know you want to see somebody beat the shit out of their guitar and mean it yeah 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 and you don't need technical ability to do that. And like, I mean, he has technical ability, but he knows also how to channel something into his guitar, which is which is almost more important. If you've got technical ability and you want to make your guitar sound horrible, you, you're already at an advantage to if it's just one or the other. Right? It's, I mean, it's so rare for someone who's that natural a guitar player and who can play so slickly and professionally when he wants to, to be all about the serrated edges and, you know, the virtue of, of sloppiness. Well, like as an acoustic guitarist, he's got the, the hardest and sloppiest strumming hand in the business. <laughs> and as a lead guitarist, nobody got away with playing like that while having their chops respected. Do you know what I mean? Except Neil Young. Because he wasn't a garage guy who couldn't play and he wasn't an out-and-out slasher like Lou Reed or someone, you know. He was, a, he was a bloke who could really play, but what he played sounded like that by choice. And every other famous rock guitarist of the 70s, when they're playing a five-minute solo and they want to bring it to a peak, they end up doing huge wailing string bends really high up the neck because that's the only kind of musical climax they can think of. Whereas Neil Young would take these long solos and bring them to a peak by making the solo fall apart. So it literally sounded like it was breaking, like in Like a Hurricane, with with the grand crescendo of his monster solo in Like a Hurricane, um, is where it sounds like the solo is shattering, literally like like a bit of glass shattering, like it's not... It's not enough to just not play guitar pompously like the rest of the Guitar Hall of Fame. No, you have to play anti-pompously. 
because even at his silliest and his worst, the the one thing you can't say about Neil Young is that he's pompous. So his biggest and most heroic guitar solo climaxes by falling apart like when a glass window shatters and it all drops out of the frame. That's the peak of Like a Hurricane. It's remarkable. I think it's peculiar then that for somebody with such a kind of physical guitar presence who's very primal in his playing that he was introduced to us in in the 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 kind of one of the first things he became famous for is that fabulously delicate part in uh, for what it's worth by yeah. Buffalo Springfield. We'll move on to um our uh, our favorite songs and one of mine was I it what it's not going to be that but one of mine was going to be for what it's worth by Buffalo Springfield just because of the presence of that song it's uh, it's so it's very iconic and it's used in a lot of Vietnam movies I remember it being in Forrest Gump it transcends a lot of what the rest of his career is about it sounds very different you wouldn't necessarily associate it with Neil Young um so that's why I didn't pick it I didn't think it particularly represented what what his career seemed to be about um but yeah to I mean to move on to what what our favorite songs are um my my choice is is a fa- I imagine it's a fairly obvious one but I haven't spoken to that many Neil Young diehards so maybe not um but my favorite song is Southern Man mainly because I'm going through a, a bit of a um a political epiphany myself uh moving far 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 left of where I used to be um I think those kind of lyrics they're very they 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 strike a chord with me at the moment um but just as a song i think it's it's very um primal to touch upon what you were saying with this guitar playing and it is essentially a guitar song and it, i think his it, his guitar playing is is masterful as well as the really striking lyrics i think it's one of those songs um that may be uh, misconstrued by a lot of the American public in the same way that Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA is. Um, I imagine that there's a lot of Southern pride in Southern Man, uh, but I don't think the song is very complimentary towards uh, the South, uh, the Southern attitudes at the time. So I think it's an important song um, about um, the racism in the South, references to Ku Klux Klan, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that, that's my my favourite song. You know, he, st- he stopped playing Southern Man, partly because he was sick of it, uh, but also he was playing it one night at a big stadium gig and some kid in the crowd jumped up and started freaking out while the guitar solo was uh, raging. Um, and a black cop or security guard stepped forward and knocked him out with a truncheon. And he said he couldn't handle the just the mental implosion of playing Southern Man while watching a black cop beat a white kid unconscious it was like no this is just every this is all just wrong now this doesn't, yeah you know living in bizarro world, yeah you just never want <laughs> to play it again yeah i'm i'm not usually good at picking favorite songs because i, I know we put you on the spot but... no but i find it difficult to put songs in traps like greyhounds do you know what i mean and then release the the mental hair and race them around white city stadium i can't do it much but for the sake of argument which is always a good excuse I really thought about this and I thought of picking A Man Needs a Maid just because everybody hates it and I think it's fantastic. I like that song. Yeah, I love it because it's so sprawling and in discipline musically, but he holds it together just with that musical charisma that I was talking about, that sheer force of personality. Even the fucking London Symphony Orchestra start playing at one point, you know. Yeah. Um, and I was also thinking of Will to Love for the same reason. It's the most all over the place thing he ever did. And I just can't think of anybody else who would ever have done that and got away with it. But I can't do it. I can't pick a deep cut and stay honest. Um, and it's not necessarily a good thing to stay honest, but I think when you're talking about Neil Young, you probably should. So to stay in the spirit of things, uh, my favourite Neil Young song is probably After the Gold Rush, just for personal reasons, partly because it's the first Neil Young song I ever heard, although it was in the form of the a cappella cover by Prelude, which was uh, a hit in, I don't even know when, the 70s, I guess, because my dad had the seven inch of it. And I used to listen to that as a kid, not knowing who Neil Young was or anything about it. 
and be totally absorbed and intrigued by the lyrics, which were not at all like the song lyrics I was used to, and how incredibly beautiful the melody was, even though it didn't really do anything. I mean, it didn't do anything unusual, but it sounded unbelievably beautiful. And then later, after The Gold Rush, was also the first Neil Young album that I ever heard. After years of hearing about how great he was meant to be, it turned out one of my mate's dads had After The Gold Rush. It was like, oh, right, Neil Young. So, and as luck would have it, <laughs> the summer that we found that album was also the summer when we all got into smoking pot. So uh, you can imagine that was that. So once we got past the initial shock of uh, fucking hell, this bloke sounds like Kermit's nephew. Um, <laughs> and, and that became an intriguing feature of the record rather than a flaw. And after the Gold Rush, he's got his highest, readiest singing on any of his albums. Um, mm. But yeah, the, the, the fantastic dryness and obsessive non-slushiness of how that song is presented and how the whole album is presented um contrasting with the sort of childlike feel of a lot of those songs especially after the gold rush the sort of like fairy tale feel of the song itself and that sort of balance of melancholy and naivety um and so and toughness and vulnerability do you know what i mean he sounds like a sort of a, a grizzled bloke in boots doing a, a, a song that is sung in a very high-pitched voice um, that's very sweet and beautiful. And, yeah, and also the combination of simple honesty and drugged-up bullshit, you know. All these things complement each other very well, I think. And then the horn solo comes in and it sounds like the sun coming up, you know. I know yeah. he wrote better songs, but that's the first one for me and it's like the first uh the first anything you know it's never the best but it's, although i've got to say only the record i i don't like any live recording of the song after the gold rush because partly because he always mashes the chords staccato on the piano which sounds horrible um but mostly because of how the crowd always cheer when he sings i felt like getting high like yeah, it's what, yeah. Twats, you know. It's it's like a moment where someone drops a glass at a British pub yes. and everyone goes, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> if you ever if you haven't heard it, so the the thing that tell that tells me how good a song after the gold rush is, and I think it is a good song and it's a really simple melody, is the Flaming Lips first three albums, like let's face it, they couldn't play their instruments. I mean, they actually say in, in interviews, I think their first three albums are designed to put people on bad acid trips because right. they're, just, they're just appallingly bad. And like the Flaming Lips cover the Batman theme on, on like a B-side and it's... They, be, they better not have touched Bat Dance. No, no, but they, they, like, they were abysmal at their instruments. Bearing in mind, they started off in like 86 as their first EP came out and nobody really knows about the Flaming Lips until they're vaguely in the subconscious in about 94. Um, so, but they do a cover of Neil Young's After the Gold Rush and they turn it into like a garage rock song, but it still stands as a decent song because Wayne Coyne can channel his sort of Neil Young. He's almost got, he hasn't quite got the musical charisma, but they back it up with some big guitar and it actually played badly and it still sounds like a good song. Yeah. And it's, there are, there are a couple of entry points back into Neil Young's catalog. And for me, that was one, I think I bought this box set of CDs and it was on it and it was a box set of the Flaming Lips first three albums because the soft bulletin had come out. Um, yes, yeah, so it would have been around 99 the soft bulletin had come out and I bought that and I loved that. So I was like, oh, well, I'll get this. And it's got their first three albums on it. And it was fucking dreadful. But their cover of After the Gold Rush, yeah. which is at the end of disc three, I had to get through a lot of shit to get there. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the Flaming <laughs> Lips. They don't um, do anything for me. Uh, uh, yeah, at the end of disc three, when I finally got there, there was this one nugget of brilliance and it's their cover of After the Gold Rush. <laughs> Tom, what is your favourite Neil Young song then? Well, this is going to be actually quite quick because both my favourite Neil Young song is also my favourite Neil Young cover is a cover of this song. Um, and it's a song that you guys have already discussed at length and it's Cortez the Killer. 
Um, and the reason it's my favourite Neil Young song... Because it fucking rules. <laughs> it's, it's because they, when I first went to university in, in 2005, I discovered Built to Spill. And I absolutely loved Built to Spill. And I had their live album on CD and they do a 20, is it 22 minute version of Cortez the Killer? And because he is such a good, like the guitarist from Built to Spill, I can't remember his name, is such a good guitarist. Um, and he's got such a nice, loose way of playing. Um, and he sort of nails the Neil Young style, but drags out the guitar solos even longer than Neil Young would get away with, but still makes it sound massive. Um, and so that's my favourite cover for that reason. Just um, And then Cortez the Killer, um, because... And I'm going to sound awful. So <laughs> I, I love Smashing Pumpkins. I like drink. in the 90s. I love, yeah, absolutely, everybody drink. Um, and Cortez the Killer is like the blueprint... For, for my one of my favourite pumpkin songs, which is Poor Selena of the Vast Oceans. If you listen to Cortez the Killer and then Poor Selena of the Vast Oceans directly after each other, Smashing Pumpkins have totally ripped off Neil Young. Yeah. <laughs> and I know liking a song because it's been ripped off by something you love is not necessarily the best justification, but it's also a good song as well. <laughs> well, the lyrics are bollocks. Um, and he's clearly like, but musically... You know, it's it's like double drop D, big chords, bit of distortion, guitar so like interesting guitar solos um, over a simple chord progression, and Neil Young's vocal. You know, it's 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 great. Yeah, it is amazing. <laughs> My choice, Southern Man. There is a particularly good live version uh, on um, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young's. Uh, Four, uh, four Way Street, I think yeah. it is, um, their live album. Uh, there's a 12-minute version of Southern Man that I think they introduce it saying, this is this is a, usually a very long song, but we're going to play it slow tonight. Um, and they just rip into it. And with the added backing vocals of, of Crosby, Stills and Nash, it, it's just epic. I love that version. Um, there's so many good live versions of his, uh, his songs, which seems quite evident so i mean the only live album that i actually checked out was um russ never sleeps which isn't really a live album it's kind of a fabricated live album i did check out some of the unplugged album from 93 um, yeah, he's still which, at it which at seems that point. quite good yeah, yeah. he's still pretty good the uh, uh, russ never sleeps was followed up by an, al- an album called live rust which is just is an actual live album of all those songs like probably a little bit touched up in studio just because all live albums were but you know it's presented as an authentic live album but it's a double live album so he does all the oldies on it and stuff uh it's all right you know have you ever seen that film that he did the journey through the past um no it's awful by the way (laughs) but it's sort of interesting it's like his film that he did in the early 70s and it's just stuff that he shot himself or got people to shoot on 16 millimeter around him, just of his life and him doing stuff. And there's no editing in it. So it's like he goes to do an interview at a radio station and you see him all going up in the lift and walking down the corridor and then going, Oh, hello, hello. And it just goes on forever. And there's a bit where (laughs) him and his girlfriend are driving his car on, I think in his, the driveway to his house or his ranch. And they just stop the car, get out Rolls a joint, lights a joint, smokes a joint, eats some strawberries, gets back in the car and drives up. And it's about 10 minutes long. Nothing, there's no talking or anything. He just <laughs> thought people might want to watch that. But it's interspersed with some live recording. And it's got um, footage of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young doing Southern Man, which I'm not sure if it's the version on Four Way Street, but it sounds smoking hot. Really good. When Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young did Neil Young songs and rocked out, they're fucking great. If you yeah. see them doing um, Down by the River on um, some TV, if you, it's the clip of them doing Down by the River anyway on American TV. And they're, it's their full, like, coked-up Kings of the World period. Uh, but I've got to admit, it's fucking amazing. They're not really that well-received in the UK. No. Uh, well, not these Crosby, Stills and Nash. No, I mean, they. I, I think 
the only thing people really associate them with is that scene in Only Fools and Horses, where they use our house uh, in the <laughs> one where they all get the money. Uh, and for years, I think that was my only knowledge of them. Uh, and then I started becoming a bit more musically enlightened. Um, and they're, they're actually really good. Um, I like a lot of that stuff as well. Like Three Dog Night are quite similar to that kind of vibe. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's just such a wealth of stuff that Neil Young's vaguely involved with yeah. that's so interesting. Yeah, the trouble with Crosby, Stills and Nash is that a lot of their most famous songs are by Graham Nash, who was just like a Tuppany Aitney, Paul McCartney, uh, yeah. Xerox. You know, I mean, he's terrible. He's really not good. I try to um, think what I would have heard him do apart from Crosby, Stills and Nash. And I looked up, he was in the Hollies. Yeah, um, yeah. And I thought, okay, well, maybe... No, he didn't sing on any of the ones that you know. He doesn't sing on The Air That You Breathe. He doesn't sing on He's Not Heavy. He's no, not he'd left there. by that point. He does the high harmony on all their good 60s singles, but he's not the, okay. lead, he's not the lead vocalist. Um, yeah. So when he's just going, eh, in the back, because he could hit those glass-shattering notes, like full-throated, um, that's very good. But that's his job. That's what he should do. For the rest of his life, he's the Roger Taylor, of, yeah, uh, <laughs> not the Duran Duran one, the Queen one. <laughs> no, it's when he steps forward and becomes the lead vocalist, and it's like and sings his his kind of cringy ballads and stuff. He, he's horrible. The only other real exposure I'd had to Neil Young that that goes back because um, I I kind of listened to a lot of pop music, was obsessed with Michael Jackson, George Michael, and Prince for years, and then largely ignored everything else up until about 10 years ago. Um, but outside of that, the only thing I really knew that was Neil Young was, and this is the favourite cover that I have, um, it was St Etienne's version of yeah. Only Love Can Break Your Heart, um, which I it was the only version I knew for years and years. And I listened to After the Gold Rush and listened to that song. And... It feels strange because I feel like I've always known the Neil Young version, even though it's totally different to how the St. Etienne version sounds. And I think that's just the hallmark of a really, really well-written song. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's just catchy, it's melodic, and the mel- melody's actually sung in a different way on the uh, on the St. Etienne version. Um, it's almost a different song completely, but I, I, I really dig both versions. Yeah. Well, it's his version's in waltz time. And also the chords are different. It's the St. Etienne version, it's the same bass line, or the, the, the basic chords are played on the, the bass or on the bass notes on the synthesizer or whatever it is. But the chords over the top are completely different. So, it, yeah, because it's a simple enough song, you can do that with it. What's your favourite cover version of a Neil Young song, Taylor? Well, there aren't that many just because he's a bit idiosyncratic to cover. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So when people do cover versions of his songs, often they sort of tidy him up a bit and it's like that, it doesn't work. And It's like the gentrification of a song. Yeah, yeah. And if you play one of his songs yourself, you find that you can't help doing his voice. Do you know what I mean? It's like <laughs> whether if, you, if you do a Bob Dylan song, if you don't do it in his voice, it's like you can't find where the tune is. It's like, how does this song actually go? I don't know. Um so, and also you can't say that something is your favourite cover version unless it's better than the original. And as far as I'm concerned, there's only one cover version of a Neil Young song that's better than the original, uh, which is Wrecking Ball by Emmy Lou Harris. Um, okay. And it's a bit of its time, or actually a few years behind its time, because it's sort of, it's from the mid-90s and it's doing that sort of uh, Julie Cruz thing, you know, like all... Misty reverb oh, and yeah, Twin Peaks thing. Yeah, it's a bit like that. Sort of sounds like it's on the edge of sleep, or it's like a. As you're listening to it, it's like you're remembering something you dreamt. You know, it's mm. got that sort of feel to it. Um, and you know, produced by Daniel Lanoir and all that sort of stuff. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, that's what the original is trying to do. But the original just sounds a little bit sluggish and a bit full of gout. You know, by comparison um and this cover version really works and partly because emmy lou harris's singing is brilliant in exactly the same way that neil young's singing is brilliant except that she's a much better singer technically so they put her voice sort of crackling and flickering 
over this hushed, vague, expensive, drifting backing track, which is the way to draw out the grain and the imperfections of her voice and bring out the pain in her voice. And there's a genuine air of tragedy about it. It's a song that needs to be sung by a middle-aged singer because it's a middle-aged song. Um, and she does it beautifully. And But it's done with the kind of conscious sound design that Neil Young never, ever does. Um, everything Neil Young's ever done, it's just what you're listening to is what it sounded like in the room. You know, that's... A, well, apart from the early stuff he used to do with Jack Nitcher, where it was like uh, he'd put weird orchestrations on it and stuff, but that was very much uh, out of character. Pretty much everything Neil Young has done since 1969, it's just you're listening to what was in the room at the time. Whereas Emmy Lou Harris does Wrecking Ball as a as a production, um, and it just brings certain feelings and a sort of spookiness out of the song that was always there, but that you don't really get in his version. So that's my choice. I, I haven't heard it. I'll have to check that one out. It's lovely. <laughs> I know I didn't ask this as a question beforehand, but I was trying to think who who would be the artist I'd most like to cover Neil Young that hasn't, to the best of my knowledge. Um, I was, trying, I was thinking, it'd be interesting if he was covered or worked with Giorgio Moroder. I don't know why, um, but there's. Uh, I think I think it. I know where this comes from. Actually, I was listening to Random Access Memories the other day by Daft Punk, right? Um, and there's that song on there with Paul Williams. Oh, uh, yeah, called, yeah, yeah. Uh, called Touch. Um, and I was just thinking, how much better would this song be if they got Neil Young to do the, the uh, yeah. vocals on it? In your in your Neil Young listening, have you reached uh, trans yet? No, I haven't got there yeah, yet. I've, I've, I've read something now. about it. Yeah. yeah. It's all like, it's kind of, it doesn't sound like a Giorgio Moroder record, but it's got that generation of tech on it, you know, and he's all, okay. sort of, and he sings a lot through a vocoder on it, and it's all like, sounds computerized and stuff. And it's really good. It, it suits him much better than you think it would. And I mean, a lot of the album is terrible, but the good stuff on it, if you listen to the song Transformer Man, um, it works beautifully. It's just a, a, a sweet Neil Young tune but done in a sort of uh, like a robot music kind of way. It's brilliant, yeah. You, yeah. I think you're dead right. If you put him with Moroder, I think it would have been fabulous. He would never have done it, but, but yeah, that would have been great. Yeah, I, I, it helps that I'm currently going through a Italo disco renaissance, but, but yeah, <laughs> I was listening to Cleo Faces yes. the other day. That's, what a song. Yeah, 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 that's my favourite <laughs> one. That's my favourite one. Okay. <laughs> um, we've kind of reached the end of the discussion um, in terms of uh, the structure to things. But Taylor, did you get did you get the chance to review any of Neil Young's records while you were working at Melody Maker? No, not um, no, none of them. No, I also, I didn't get to review him live either. Not even on a festival bill, um, which because he used to play all the festivals at that, uh, that time. Uh, no, never. So you never got to rub shoulders with Neil Young? No. Well, I wouldn't. I don't think I'd been rubbing shoulders with him because he's about six foot two, <laughs> um, five foot seven. But yeah, it was. Uh, no, I, I, I don't think I'd have got on with Neil Young. Do you know what he I mean? He does seem like a, a, a quite obtuse guy. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and I, I imagine he's quite prickly about certain things. But I, I imagine a lot of superstars that have that musical charisma that you talk about I mean, we're talking your your princes your your stevie wonders i imagine they're in, almost impossible to get on with because they don't think on the same level they're thinking in terms of music and analyzing chords yeah. all the time <laughs> no i think that's right i, I mean i i there's people that i interviewed that i really didn't get on with and a lot of the time, those were people who were seen as being good eggs and good blokes, right? And there's a lot of people I interviewed that were supposed to be very difficult that I got on really well with. Like I got on with really well with Marky e. Smith. I interviewed him uh, twice, and I met him about two other times, just, you know, 
in the course of my duties. Um, and we got on really well. Um, and everyone always talks about oh, Marky Smith, what a bastard. Well, yeah, I mean, he was a lot of the time. But he was just one of those people who would make a snap decision when he met you. And if he liked you, he was really nice to you. And if he just decided he didn't like you, he'd be horrible to you. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think, I can't see, I could even imagine myself meeting Lou Reed and just saying something that made him laugh or saying something that he responded to positively. You know what I mean? But Neil Young, I can't do it. I, although I feel as though I understand Neil Young musically, I don't think um, there would be any common ground on which we could uh, build any sort of temporary friendship yeah. in an interview situation. I just can't see it. Mm. I, I can't see it. I thought that when I was watching an interview with Bruno Mars the other day, I was like, I think he's great as a performer and I, I find him genuinely entertaining. But if I was in a room with him one-on-one, -on -one, I think I'd find him a little bit unbearable. Yeah. Yeah, I can believe that. <laughs> I don't know how we've gotten to Bruno Mars on a Neil Young episode, but we are the masters of the tangent. Who was uh, go on then, Taylor? Who who was the who was the worst the person that you interviewed? <laughs> the the one that I respected the least was John Squire out of uh, the Stone Roses. Um, not, but I'm sure he's probably uh, an all right bloke in his private life, but he was trying to be. You know, oh, I'm too clever for the interviewers. And, you know, he's trying to be like sort of Dylan in Don't Look Back or something. But Dylan only, could only pull it off in Don't Look Back because he was cleverer than the people who were interviewing him. Because John Squire is, is, is not, <laughs> not that clever. So he just seemed like just a sullen oaf who was being deliberately uh, rude and uncooperative. Um, and I learned a trick from a, an older journalist, which uh, always used to work when people are doing that. You just switch the tape recorder off, as it was at the time, and say, oh, well, all right, then, if you don't want to do it, I'll go. <laughs> at which point they suddenly decide, no, actually, they do want to do this interview for their big feature in the music paper. <laughs> and they ask you to come back. And you say, well, do you want to do the interview or not? And they go, yeah, 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 all right. Um, and after that, they tend to be a bit more caught. <laughs> Quite the achievement to be uh, named when you're in a band with Ian Brown. Uh, yeah, well, I never, I, I never encountered Ian Brown. Oh, okay. <laughs> Although I, I, I know some people who did. He did leave a voice message on uh, Neil Kukani's answer phone, threatening to break his leg. <laughs> um, which Neil sort of laughed off until someone told him that Ian Brown is a, a black belt at martial arts. <laughs> 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 Took it a little bit more seriously. There are plenty of stories like that on Chart Music, so for the listeners, if you haven't checked out Chart Music, we already had David Stubbs on. Um, go and listen to that if you want more of that kind of, uh, those kind of spicy stories. Um, it's kind of the end of uh, end of the run. Um, I've certainly learned a lot about Neil Young, so I hope that, that knowledge has been passed on to the listeners, um, because it's he's, a, he's, he's an overwhelmingly exhausting artist to get into uh there's so many facets of his music um so i'm just on that journey but it's been absolutely fantastic to hear from yourself taylor to get your opinions on where to go what sort of songs you would recommend and just your general thoughts on an artist who it sounds like you've been dying to uh turn the tap off uh, and uh just unload on well don't you think when when you're listening to neil young now do you does it not seem incredible to you that this man was a superstar in the 1970s he was uh, he would fill stadia yeah with his gigs he would play he would do stadium gigs that's how big and successful he was it's unbelievable when you listen to those records if he was around now age 26 he'd be he'd be on an indie label in toronto you know and his gigs would be to 200 people in a hipster bookshop mm. in Brooklyn or some is it an intimate chance to hear the Neil Young then he would have a nice but fairly small flat which he bought when one of his songs was on the soundtrack of a Judd Apatow movie yeah um he'd only be known for like a crossover hit with someone like Drake who who, yeah. who, who turns like some who did some folk country trap uh, and that yeah. would be his one big hit, and he'd have like a, a really embarrassing line about liking Wendy's or something in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he'd, he'd, you know, and he'd do a benefit for Bernie Sanders and stuff, and he'd look exactly the same. Um, <laughs> but yeah, in 1972, this, you know, you could be like the biggest rock star in the world 
standing there with your shirt hanging out, sort of shambling around the stage, playing these guitar solos that fall to pieces after five minutes. Yeah. And it's strange that that exists, say, in the same contemporaneous environment as David Bowie in uh, his Ziggy Stardust persona. Um, you've got Neil Young on one side of the Atlantic, just flannel shirt will do, and then David Bowie is an actual alien uh, presenting himself on stage. It's just it's, yeah. music in the seventies was so so different than it is now, where everything's kind of viewed through the same narrow lens, but just on uh, on more platforms. Um, whereas then you had whole different worlds of counterculture. Yeah, although I would say that Neil Young and David Bowie have got more in common than what separates them in like yeah. everything that separates the, the ways in which they were completely polarized is are mostly superficial the aesthetics of it yeah they're both quite uncompromising musically i think to a degree but i think Bowie was probably more willing to compromise than young was well yeah i, I guess so but also he, i mean he was more pop you know he was always more pop but it's i'm thinking more as songwriters where you can do something that's dead simple but somehow it not only works but it it has incredible magnetism and appeal to it far beyond what you think it was if you just look at the chords and the and how the tune goes right like the the neil young song that i always think of like this is um i believe in you off after the gold rush where i but until I actually sat down and worked out what the chords to that song are, I could never understand it because it seems to meander all over the place and go everywhere. And I'm thinking, what is this crazy song? And I finally sat down and worked it out. There are five chords in that song, that's all. And none of them are particularly strange or particularly uh, surprising. But But if you play guitar or piano and you look at the chords in that song, you're immediately struck by how weird the arrangement of those chords against the beat is and how nobody else would have arranged them in that order, in that rhythm. And then there's a in the chorus, there's a sudden D chord that comes in and changes key out of nowhere as the chorus peaks. And it's not difficult... It's not like some incredible feat of composition. It's not even particularly musical, if you know what I mean. He's just throwing things in and seeing what works. But it's a stroke of pure genius, which suddenly elevates this song to this level of emotional power that it wouldn't have had if he hadn't put that weird bit in it, you know? In the same way that it goes from one chord to the other at a different time to when you'd expect it to, and it's not it's not like a an Everly Brothers song where you might hear the same chords, but it all moves in a circle and it all, it it sounds like something that makes musical sense to you. I believe in you has this sort of meandering feel to it that makes it sound much more complicated than it really is. Um, And that's a, that's one of those things that you can't fake. It's just instinctive musical talents will do that. Right. Of all the wonderful things that you can, manufacture or that you can contrive in pop music that's one that you can't and if you've got it you just do it you just go oh, i've just written a song it took me 10 minutes and people just stand there going how the fuck did you write this well you know i just didn't think about it too hard well, that's the ever disappointing qu- uh, answer to every question in music isn't it is like well what what is that song about i don't really know is is the genuine answer to most things it's the dirty secret is that when you interview musicians, the ones with the most natural raw talent are the ones who've got the least to say about their music. And the ones with the least natural musical talent are always the ones with the most to say because they're the guys who have to bulk up their music with conscious thoughts, conscious ideas, moves, yeah. things that they're doing deliberately. And they can talk about that stuff. Whereas those guys who just sit at the piano and 10 minutes later they've written, I believe in you, you can't ask them about no. that because, it, you know, it, they, they don't know what they've done. And it's like, it's a bit dreary as an interviewer because they're just sat there and they look at you, well, all right, ask me another question. And it's like, well, you you wear a check shirt and, and 
<laughs> just shamble around, not saying anything. There's nothing else I can <laughs> ask you. I don't want to ask you what you think about vaccines. I don't just. I just want to ask you about your music, and you've got nothing to say. Very frustrating. Those talented bastards. Uh, uh, I could have gone on for another hour. Unfortunately, we don't have another hour, um, but uh, we will end there. Um, thank you very much for coming on. Um, for those of you listening, uh, you can find us. We'll be back with main episode soon. We still got our album of the year episode to come. Uh, we're doing we're doing shit show and tell in March, uh, and uh, we've also got various articles on the blog. You can you know where to find us. All the normal links. Taylor, is there anything that you uh, that you should make our listeners aware of that they should be checking out? Uh, just listen to chart music, which for anyone who doesn't know is a podcast that I'm on where small group of old but very good music writers um, talk about an old episode at the top of the pops and socio-cultural issues arising from it humorously uh, and for a very long time it does last uh, five or six hours but it is monthly and it is broken up into four episodes which are each the length of a normal podcast so you can listen to one a week if you so choose or gorge on the full-size episode if you've got a transatlantic flight coming up or a a drive from plymouth to wick and although it's all about pop cultural history it's very much not ha ha look at their trousers or ha does anyone remember fucking spangles it's a a genuine attempt to critique and contextualize old shit with the seriousness uh or lack of seriousness that it deserves uh like share subscribe Well, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, Taylor. Uh, So thank you very much. We'll end the show here. So uh, make sure you stay funky and do whatever you've got to do. It's Pancake Day today. I'm going to have some pancakes. It's irrelevant, though, Pancake Day, because nobody really cares about it until it's actually Pancake Day. I didn't even know. I literally only found out it was Pancake Day now. So we hope you had a good Pancake Day, listeners. So yeah, we'll uh, just say goodbye. Stay funky. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> well, it's a concept pod, uh, concept podcast. It's, yeah. We're, we're, we're trying to channel that Neil Young energy into the. <laughs> it's like we're it's all we're all over the place, stopping, starting, rambling, broken up sentences. But my God, the content.